Hello, everyone. This is Robert Gowan. You're listening to the Mentors for Military podcast. And on tonight's In the Strategy show, we've got Scott and Mike both as our guest. And uh, we're going to be talking about the topic of selection. What's going on this evening, guys? Hey, Robert. How are you? Good, man. Doing really good. Uh, we've been having a good old uh, conversation prior to the show. It's always good to do the pre-up uh, prior to it. Um, we've got some good stuff to talk about, and I hope that everybody's in the uh, Mixler chat room. And if you're not, make sure that you create an account with MIXLR, log in, and join us in the chat room. As we go through the show, it's always good to hear your opinions, your voice, communicate with you, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so by creating those accounts, it allows us to do it. So we're going to dive right into this uh, topic. And Scott, you kind of presented it to us as a uh, potential uh, topic and when we started brainstorming about the idea it really resonated especially with uh, military transition to the private sector uh, but there's um, even military elements private sector elements that are separate from that um, so tell us a little bit about um, how you kind of came up with the idea uh, no no issues um, selection is a topic I mean any SF guy that, that you talk to is going to have a thousand stories about selection I mean I can go into you know rolling my ankle and limping so bad that the the skin on the entire opposite foot came off when I took off my boot so when when Mike was telling his story the other day about the rain and the cold and the blisters and the blood I, I can easily resonate with that right like it's something that no matter what soft branch you're in from you know the newly formed MARSOC to SF guys to SEALs or whoever they're going to have some hellacious type of story about selection in these events. And, and to our core, we understand that the selection of personnel is absolute essential for the success of the entire organization. That if you don't have the right people, I mean, in fact, when, when I started my company, the Kinder Group, I started having this epiphany, like, what do I know that I can teach organizations in the SF truths that I had kind of lived by the whole time? And as a federal civilian at Marsoc and, and other places, I knew that the, the SF truths were the core of me, right? The, the five truths are humans are more important than hardware. Quantity, quality is better than quantity. Special operations forces cannot be mass produced. You can't create special operations forces after an emergency. And then most special operations forces require non-special operations forces support. So if everybody wraps their head around that just for a minute, each one of those five special forces tru truths has a high degree of selecting the right people, selecting the right quality people, selecting the right missions that you're doing, selecting the right time to do it, and then making sure that they are empowered and educated to conduct those, those operations. So selection is, is more than just a simple okay, we got the right guys. We've got pipe hitter academic guys that can ruck for 40 kilometers at a time with heavy weights on their back, and then we can teach them to shoot straight. Selection is about, when you take it in the corporate world, it's bigger, right? So when we talk selection in, in, in the Army, and we have a doctrinal publication that, that I, I read many, many times as a civilian just to keep myself true to North, we, we talk about R3 compliancy, which is you know R3 planning, right partner, right location, right capability. And we'll get into that, but each one of those as well is about selecting the right things and the right muscle memory and the right mission sets and the right operations. And in the civilian world, that translates to the right customers, the right operations, the right things to do, the right quote-unquote opportunities. If you listen to the De Espresso Libera podcast, they, they talked about having disguised opportunities come their way with investors and buyout opportunities and potential strategic partners that they had to rightfully stick to their core and say, not the right time. So I'll, I'll quit talking for a minute and, and let everybody kind of digest that, but it is very near and dear to me. No, I think it's spot on. I mean, uh, when you start thinking about, too, um, as it relates to the private sector and evaluating uh, people that they want to have in their corporation, within their company or business, um, they're trying to cr select the right fit uh, for the opportunity or for the job. Um, they're trying to go through a selection process so, um, you know, to get the right candidates uh, from the uh, the group and the pool that they're evaluating. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's it's really key. And for the transitional component of it, I mean, you're, you're trying to make sure that uh, you're going out there and evaluating and analyzing all that's uh, available to you. 
Um, but in first, you got to make sure you understand your personal brand. You got to understand, you know, that it's right and everything. You got to understand what kind of elevator speech and everything you're going to present when it comes to that opportunity of how you're going to present yourself. And um, you got to understand the industry that you're wanting to go into, um, the profession that you're wanting to attack, maybe the geographical region uh, that you're wanting to go to. And then you can kind of start that selection process thereafter. Um, that we well, see, I, I agree and I disagree because if you alternate and substitute select into much of what you just said, Robert, you're, you're getting truly to the core of it, right? When you're transitioning, yeah. if you select the right geographical area that you want to live in and you select the right industry that you want to apply for jobs in and you select the right kind of company that you want to apply to and you select the right words upon your resume and you select the right image projection when you interview, right? Like, it, <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I mean, totally, yeah. I agree with you. Um, I, I think that's why selection is so broad, but how we're going to kind of, you know, tee this up and bring it in is, as you kind of described in the opening, and um, certainly for those who are on active duty that are thinking about transition, uh, it'll be a big piece of it. So um, I, I think one of the main things we can talk about or maybe kind of getting down through the eaches is really – so identifying um, the right proper identification of people. So, you know, how important who, who is that? Hasn't, who hasn't been there when you get a new soldier, Marine, sailor, civilian, employee, insert title here, right? Who hasn't been there when that person shows up and you're stuck with them and they're worthless? And, and you're just, you had no ability to help select those people underneath your commander or resident to you in your company or in your unit or whatever. I, I'm guessing the you know retired command sergeant major Pritz here definitely has some some topics to say on that. But when you get those people that add zero to the organization within there, and you don't have that ability to select them, but you've left selection to others, that's problematic sometimes. Never in tenth group. Ne never happened in tenth group. <laughs> Not while I was there. No. Yeah, I didn't think so. I you know I, I'd like to address it from a, a different perspective, Scott. You know if you, if you look at it, um, everybody asks soft guys. It probably branch in specific, right? But everybody asks us, hey, what did you do to prepare to go to selection? What did you do on the input, not necessarily the output to be selected, but what did you do to prepare? Um, and I could talk about that on on the the actual military side, but what we're looking at is is guys transition into, you know, really where you guys both have been. So uh, well, we can talk a little bit about how you did the selection, but what would you expect somebody to do to prepare themselves to come and meet you for the first time? <laughs> so what I would th uh, look at is, you know, I talked a lot about this in my book actually is about understanding first who your peer group is, um, understanding what your skills that you bring to the table are, um, again, doing a lot of self-assessment um, and then s assessment of where did there, you know, where, where it is that you want to go in terms of level too. Uh, you know, if you think that you're, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys that come on active, uh, come off active duty. And they feel like because of whatever they did in the military, and, and Scott and I saw an article here recently um, that maybe we can go ahead and bring that in because it might be relevant, is, is we've seen somebody that says, why hire an MBA when you can hire a military person? Um, do we not see that there's not a relationship here? Uh, it's not the same thing. Just because you have work experience does not mean you have the education. Education doesn't mean you have the experience. They're two separate things. But you need to understand then if you're making statements like that, who, where you fit in, who your peer group is, who are you going to be competing against? Because when it comes down to it and you throw that resume out there, are you going to be the right person that they're going to select because did you apply for the level and position that you could even reach for and get? Let's face it. I mean, there might be a lot of people out there that are reaching for positions that they're not even, it's not even attainable. Um, so again, it's about the homework up front. For me, that's, that's really where it begins. Before you start um, thinking about the industry, uh, the geographical, uh, geographical location, uh, the types of specific jobs, the level of the job that you're wanting to go into. I mean, it, it kind of goes into all of that. Well, what I what I discuss with clients when, when I talk about 
making sure that you know creating this elite organization right and creating these these elite you know abilities within you and empowering your subordinates I, I really break it down into three things that, that I look for is is a business person when I'm selecting somebody or what I'm looking for and, and those three things are I want somebody that can think critically that has a critical thinking you know context about them that can can do some problem solving I want to look at their inherent ability and what they actually bring to the table and I want to see how adaptable they are and how bound or not they are to a set of rules or guidelines you know how much do they need to be tasked right so because of my background that's somewhat skewed I want a, a free thinking critical thinking guy that's self motivated can operate on their own that fire and forget type employee and, and they're rare but that's when standards come into play and, and you'll notice you know adaptability the subject of our, our last strategy room is high on that 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 necessity that I need I need somebody that I, I don't want to babysit somebody in essence if I had to put a simple phrase on it looking for an employee as a business owner and again I'm not talking straight from the kinder group you know but I'm looking back at my time at, at Morgan Stanley you know when, when I was there and the internet.com startup and and definitely my time at Starbucks before somebody forgets to bring that up today. So I'm looking at what is kind of this holistic <laughs> type person that we're, we're looking for. And, and that's who it is, right? So the three things, again, just, just for the chat room, critical thinking, it, and it's more than just a, a, a cool buzzword, adaptability and inherent ability. I, I, I care less that you went to Harvard if you're bound by rules and need me to babysit you every day. It sounds like you're looking for a soft guy. Or girl, doesn't matter. <laughs> With barista qualifications, uh, so yeah, I, I think um, I think those are uh, key pieces and stuff as you start uh, going down through it because a lot of times people do get wrapped up. And I had a conversation on an earlier call today uh, about a similar topic that a lot of times human resources um, talent uh, people get really wrapped up into the very specifics or into stereotyping. So they start looking at. Um, I need somebody with, you know, a background with five years, this experience. So that means you're going to automatically throw out somebody with three and a half years experience. No, that's not what I'm saying as a hiring manager. But if you take me too literal, then you may end up throwing out something uh, that is uh, or individuals that are really qualified for the position. Or I would have assumed qualified for the position because you're the, the pre-screener for me. You're starting to take things too literal. Or they start stereotyping. Oh, okay. You have industry experience in, you know, um, the uh, biopharmaceutical industry. Therefore, it doesn't apply to the automotive industry. Well, that might not be necessarily true, too. If it's manufacturing or if it's logistics or procurement or something like that, it's the same type of thing. You're procuring equipment, resources. So I think at times they get caught up in trying to select that right person and if they think more broadly at what you're doing, uh, what you're describing of what the ideal candidate is, I think we won't get caught up in those generalities or those specifics that end up um, nailing us down too many times and not allowing us to get the right people. You know, I, I think something that Ryan said in the chat room about preparation is what I was really getting at is, you know, as you're, as you're entering the process um, and, and Robert, you talked about self-assessment earlier. Once you've done that self-assessment, you determine where you're wanting to go and where you want to live, there's still a level of preparation that has to be done uh, before you can ever expand into a new industry. I mean, you're, you're changing a lot of what you're doing. And, and a lot of guys, I think, now uh, believe that, you know, we've, we've, we're war heroes. We can walk out. We can do just about anything. And I think given the opportunity, a lot of guys will be successful, but they, they have to put the preparation in first, just like when they were going to selection to get into soft. Um, they're going to prepare for the new career. Preparation is such a critical piece of it. I mean, and, and the planning. So when you're talking about the preparation, you're really talking about, too, the planning and, and making sure that you've created enough, and we've said this in previous podcasts, runway to be able to make sure you're successful in the end. So for some people, the preparation and the planning might actually be shorter than others because they may be better equipped uh, better prepared and stuff for that transition or for that whatever it might be in next step. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the preparation and planning is so critical in the selection process from both the private sector and then you in selecting the right job, the right industry, the right company, uh, everything else. So, And I think to, to both of your points, 
a massive piece of that preparedness, and I'll be absolutely blunt here because I don't know any other way to say it, but a massive piece of that preparedness as you're transitioning is to get rid of the ego. Um, just check your ego at the door and, the and understand that you're entering a new arena. It doesn't matter if Mike was an E9, if I was an E1, if whatever. It doesn't matter when you're trying to enter into a new venture. Absolutely. And the rank is a big piece of that as well. So, you know, I can speak for myself. I came off active duty as an E8 and um, I entered into the private sector at a level that's a director level in a company and, and moved up. And, and a lot of folks thought, laughed at me. They thought there was no way that I could ever do something like that because they were so used and accustomed to the hierarchical uh, piece that was in the military that only somebody that's a major lieutenant colonel or whatever can ever roll into those types of positions. It's the reason why I ran as far as I could away from those jobs that were military related because I didn't want to be classified based on my previous rank. And, you know, I, I'm one that honestly, I don't really, um, I, I'm not a big fan of logging into sites. And the first thing that they asked me for was what was my military rank? That was a long time ago. And, and it has nothing to do with who I am or whatever. I can tell you the reason why I bring this up is because it's also very important when you're looking for the next job and you're evaluating the company and you're doing the homework and you're trying to identify if they have the right cultural fit. If one of the questions they ask you was, what was your rank when you were on active duty or when you were in the military, you know right away they're starting to classify you. It's it's just that's what they're doing. Um, and, and so... You have I learned in that first hand, Robert, by the way, apologies, but yeah. selected for E7 and SF, and then I went the federal route, and all of a sudden, as a GS, I was a full colonel's equivalent. So, you know, I've got these field grade officers looking at me and going, you were an NCO in, in group, and I was like, and yet, here I am telling you what to do and writing your fit reps. Amazing how life turns out, right? Yeah, it, it, it has nothing to do with it. Now, not everybody is equipped with the same skill sets. And, you know, just because you have rank doesn't mean that you're automatically gifted with certain skills or, you know, talents or, you know, or whatever, a background. Um, it, it really is what we are talking about, uh, what you bring to the table, how much you prepare for um, that transition, how much you prepare for, how you're going to communicate your capabilities um, to the individual who's listening to it. And um, and in selecting, I, I can't state it enough, the right culture, too, that's going to fit you uh, because that's going to be huge. Um, so when we, when we talk about the right partner, we talk about the right location, and we talk about the right capability, you know, we're really talking about, um, you know, the right company fit culture that's going to match you and what you're, you're seeking. Some people are fine with the whole military. Let me get back into that because that's a comfort zone. I feel comfortable with that, you know. Not everybody is. No, and I mean, a, a new job, a new career is literally where you're spending the bulk of your week, right? I mean, even if it's nine to four, Monday through Friday, and you're not pulling overtime or whatever, that's a s significant part of your life that you're spending at that place. And if you haven't selected the right company to begin with, and they wrongly selected you to hire you, you're both going to be equally miserable because you don't want to be there any more than they want to have you there. And you're ruining the cultural fit. So, and, and you can see that if you ever conduct interviews from the other side of it. And, and the person that comes to the table asking, well, how much is his salary? How much overtime? Me, 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 all this, you know. Well, you know, as an E8 in the military, I had a direct, you know, 15 non-combatants report to me on a daily basis. And I was a Bronze Star recipient in Afghanistan. And, and they want to tell you all about them instead of allowing the process to work and see if there's a, a holistic fit between you and the company to begin with. And why would you make yourself miserable by selecting a place that you're going to be unhappy in? So it comes back again to presenting yourself with the right foot in such a way that they'd never be able to understand uh, or n never be able to classify you by some means. And, and that was one of the, why the reason I brought up my past history is that I try to set up that resume and I try to set up my presentation of myself and my personal brand in a way you wouldn't know. As a matter of fact, the only way that you knew that there was military involved is that my employer said U.S. Army. So it was, it was about trying to, to demonstrate those skills and capabilities and um, prepare myself for selecting the right company. And the way I kind of looked at it then is when I started looking at, you know, companies and potential employers, 
I started looking deeply in what, like I said, the, the culture, um, the people that I ran into. You know, if you do get a chance to go to the interview, it's about sitting around, looking at the people who interact with each other while you're observing the, uh, the process, you know, looking at the cubes or the offices and how they maybe work within themselves, how each other, you know, are they in cube land or are they in offices? Are they in, uh, they creating silos? Are we, you know, where's the interview created? I know I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I mean, you're really assessing everything along the whole way to make selections and choices of what fits you best. And so we're, we're getting into the R3 part of the, the, the talk here, right? Because this is where, so, so R3 is a planning consideration and, and I rely on it heavily. And it consists of right partner, right location, and the right capability. So if we go right down the right partner, bullet number one, Robert, I mean, you, you nailed it, right? You're selecting the right employer. And if you're on the other side of the coin, selecting the right employee. So. And if you're an entrepreneur or transitioning, selecting the right strategic partners and investors in your in your venture, because all these things have a massive play in what's going to be your post military life after transition. Yeah, 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 I, totally. Um, so I think you know when we're talking about the right partner, I, it to me it really is about selecting the right cultural fit, the right organization where you can excel at it, and making sure that your skill set is really going to match whatever that organization has, so that you can maximize your opportunity. I mean that's really what it's all about. Is that if you're if your objective at least is to go into the uh, uh, the private sector to a company or a corporation that is and to um, excel and and grow within that company, show your value and your strengths and be able to um, you know move up through the chains and everything, then then that's what you should be looking for. Everybody has different objectives though. Not everybody's looking for corporate America. So you know you got to really find your right partner and your right, um, company or organization that you're going to belong to, however big the size. Now, smaller companies, and I'm talking maybe as small as five people, 10, 15, 15 people, or less than 100 people, are going to operate much differently than 40,000. A private company is going to operate much different from a government uh, company, much different from a large publicly traded organization, much different from a nonprofit. And this all matters, right? I tweeted out a picture of the day with my dog as a joke. She was wearing sunglasses, and I said, you know, this is what happens when Green Berets raise animals. You know, she had hands that be in her pockets. And somebody said, and, and the whole point to what I'm saying is, you know, somebody said, look, and she would be traveling and getting max per diem as well. And I went, yeah, you're right. But that fostered a, an entirely different thought in my head. When we travel as military people, travel is paid for. You log on to Defense Travel Services and DTS and you do your thing. You've got your own little corporate tr travel card. Your hotel is selected for your flights and rental cars are selected for you. And everything is, is kind of given to you. It's not a great system. I'm not embracing and, and endorsing defense travel. But SF guys get max per diem all the time. We can go out and have a few beers and we can save money and make money in the end. Now, if you haven't selected the right partner in your future employee, you're retiring as an E7, SF guy, SEAL, MARSOC, whatever. You have this background of historical prejudices and knowledge in your head, and you go to an internet startup who doesn't pay max per diem, who makes you go on air bread and breakfast and do dual lodging with somebody that you don't know and all these other cutting startup costs and these horror stories that we hear. That's a whole different paradigm than what you're used to, and that's when the frustrations and everything else set in. So do your homework, right, when, when you're selecting these partners, and be, A, self-aware, but understand and ask questions before just signing on the dotted line, just like you did when you joined the military, unless you were just blindly in need of an MOS, and ask questions about that job. Ask questions about what that employer does. Ask questions about the travel, but, you know, have the right paradigm and the right mental ability to know your value, be self-aware and know what you're looking for and what you expect and what you can put up with. Yeah, Scott, for me, you know, selecting the right partner, there's an intermediate step. And, and for the steps that I'm taking, it's been to, to select a mentor, um, to, to build my network that provides contacts into the next industry. I like that. And, um, 
Well, and, and you know, well, it's part of the, the name of the podcast. <laughs> right. But I, I didn't pick that word because it's the name of the podcast. But I, I really did reach out for mentors and, and looking at what I wanted to do next. Absolutely. Um, because, and I'm going to say something that's comfortable to every Green Bray that's listening. The way we operate when we go down range is by, with, and through our partners. So how do you how do you put that to use in your transition? Well, for me, it was to reach out to some people who are in the industry that I'm, I'm interested in asked their advice, they looked at my resume, they, that one of them completely told me I was going down the wrong road for the degree plan and recommended another course which changed uh, the way I was going and added another 14 months onto you know, the completion of it. But I, I think that that's, uh, that's what we're comfortable with doing. If we trust the systems that we understand, you know, those mentor, m- mentors are there to provide some guidance and motivation and direction. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna help you in the long run. The other thing that comes out of selecting the right partners, finding someone with access and placement. Another term all of us are comfortable hearing. Uh, if you find somebody with access and placement, their their network will also open up some doors, uh, p- potentially some some job contacts or something for you to exploit. And I, I think that within that context of transition, uh, most Green Berets should be able to to function on that first part of R three, which is uh, find the right partner. God, I love I the. Uh, Go ahead. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, Sorry, I, Rob. No, no, no. I, I love the whole mentor aspect of it because, you know, when you think of mentor, okay, so let's make it even broader. First thing, you know, you're going to look at your network, whatever that is. There may be mentors within your network, but you're going to first evaluate your for, uh, your whole network because, as we mentioned in another show, the, the importance of networking is to tap into all of them and let them know that you are seeking something, what it is that you're seeking, so they can lend the help. But then there's going to be those select few, Mike, that you're talking about that you may reach out to in a different level and go, okay, you have the skills, expertise, background, or I value your opinion enough. I'd love to hear what it is that you can tell me of what I need to do. And maybe it's your resume. Maybe it's in the interviewing process. Maybe it's looking at the right company and culture and the right fit. It's someone knowing you and go, Mike, Dude, you're looking at the wrong organizations. That's not what I mean, you're those companies I can tell you from what I know are just not gonna fit you and what you're what you're all about. Um, you know, and, and rather than having somebody stereotype stereotype for you and go, Oh, okay, you know, you were in the military, that means you're gonna want a rigid, you know, organization that's very disciplined and structured and everything else, because otherwise you're gonna be like a fish out of water here, man. You're not gonna be able to survive. You know, you don't want that. You want guys who really know who Mike is to say, this is what you should be focusing on. This is kind of where you should be going. And oh, by the way, um, what you've laid out right now, as far as a plan, isn't going to kind of get you there. And you might want to tweak your resume a little bit to, to fix, you know, what it is. They're going to really listen to, to what you have to say. They're going to be the active listener. Well, there's, there's two truisms here, right? One, we don't know who we know. And I say that like full tongue in cheek because I've had a lot of help come from Robert. You and I met on LinkedIn and then Twitter, right? So we never have crossed paths in in the physical world and been in the same town or hung out together, you know, in person. And yet you're you're a trusted confidant now, and and I bounce ideas off of you in our weekly calls, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you don't understand that, there's always going to be new people that can come into your life. And secondly, the the truism I'll, I'll address is we don't know what we don't know. And if Mike hadn't gone back to my previous point of checking his ego at the door and dismissed that advice because he thought that it was baloney or not applicable to him or whatever, in two years he'd find himself down a path that he's pretty firmly committed to and yet in the wrong lane. He's not going where he wanted to go all because we, we turn off our ears and we think that we're, we have the right answer. So sometimes You just have to be, again, check that ego and have that self-awareness to say, that's a great point. And hard right, easy wrong, all, you know, SF terms, right? Like all things that we all know and embrace, we just have to realize that some things we don't know and don't be afraid to ask for help. If I was applying for a job in a corporation, I would definitely ask anybody even tangentially attached to that corporation any question that I could get them to admit anything about it to yep. me, just so that I would have more awareness, more information coming my way on They're going to be brutally honest with you. They're the they're people that know you. They're going to be the ones that's going to say, Scott, you know, this is, you know, I know you know I work here, but uh, 
it's not where I'm going to be in two to three years. You know, I'm actually looking for my own escape route. So if you find something else, then let's stay networked because I might you know, be reaching out to you in the future. And a lot of times what you'll find is they're telling you the truth and we just don't want to hear it. We put it through this filter. They'll be giving you the keys that the company's not doing all that great. They're really not happy. You know, hey, man, I haven't had a lunch break in six months. I constantly work unpaid overtime. The boss calls me on nights and weekends and you can go, you know, I'm retired. I, I don't need that. That's not what I'm going for in, in an employer. I want something a little less extreme than that. But but we go, oh, that's just you, man. That's just how you're dealing with this company. Sure. Yeah. So being self-aware and just listening. You know, Rudy said it in previous podcasts. Mike said it in previous podcasts. Joe Healy said it. The Day Espresso Bear guy said it. Everybody has said that when you check your ego at the door and just open up those two things on the side of your head, Magic happens. Now, you know, you said a lot when you, when you said you're asking for help. You're asking for help. You're not asking for a job. You're not asking for a leg up. You're not asking for something that they probably can't deliver. Uh, you want a little bit of time yep. and, and, you know, to bounce some ideas off of them and some, something we're all very familiar with. You want counseling, yeah. you know, because, because we need that going into a, a, a different venture. And, and I think that, uh, you know, understanding that when you're going into that meeting, you, you're not expecting anything other than information, which is, you know, just really what you exposed on, Scott. Yeah. Counseling. So counseling. Counsel. When you think about that, you're seeking counsel. A lot of people don't understand when they think about it. They throw out there, you know, flippantly, oh, the counseling. And, but, I mean, you're really seeking somebody to give you the counsel to move forward as to, again, that knows you, um, understands what's in your best interest moving forward, um, and, and maybe even what your goals and objectives are. If you can, if they don't, then you need to be able to, as part of your, your personal branding and understanding and self-awareness, describe that in a way to help them counsel you better. You know, don't just necessarily take the first opportunity just because it presents itself. Make sure it is uh, a, a right fit culturally. Uh, culturally, Make sure it's going to give you the right company that's going to be able to, to help you, um, you know, achieve the goals that you want to do. I, I get it. There are many people that need to have stepping stone opportunities. I actually did it myself. Uh, but you you need to be at least aware of what's out there and open your eyes and ears enough to be able to um, listen to the council, assess the situation, and determine then if this is not the right opportunity, it's only a short period so that I can then move to the next opportunity. And, and one more final point on the partner before I think you know we move on to location and et cetera is don't be afraid to admit when you've made a mistake. Part of any soft training pipeline is failure. You're going to fail. You're not going to succeed. You're going to have impossible standards and objectives and whatever. You're going you're gonna to understand what failure is. And yet when we transition, we refuse to admit that we can make a mistake in anything. I, I partnered with a guy who I trusted as a confidant so shortly after starting the kinder group. And We've now parted paths, and I won't say a negative word about him, but he wanted to do a whole different venue and take the kinder group down a whole other path. And for a short while, I let him. I let him skew my opinion and go down what was a very wrong path for the kinder group in defense contracting. I don't want to be a defense contractor. I don't want to have to maintain security clearances and try and do you know USA jobs and do all that stuff and all the corporate infrastructure that apply. And yet I found myself being pulled down this merry little path because I was I, I trusted his advice. So eventually I had to say, this isn't what I wanted to do. This isn't where I wanted to be. I'm not engaging with the right partner, and I'm definitely not taking the right strategic partnerships, and, and I cut bait and, and moved on. So, And for a while, that was almost devastating because I went, I'm this highly successful Green Beret. I was a federal civilian. I was a colonel's equivalent. People used to kowtow to my will. I can't make a mistake. Bull, baloney. Of course I can make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. Everybody makes mistakes every day. It's just having the ability to man up and realize that you make a mistake and go, hey, it didn't kill me. I'm still us here. And, and adjust fire and move on. That's what makes you successful. I, I don't – go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say you know, selection is, is partly constant reevaluation. Um, we're talking about selection. So, so you, say you make a selection and it's a mistake. I mean most of us – have made mistakes. Heck, I'm almost 50 years old. I've made plenty of mistakes. But I, I think that if you're doing constant evaluation, whether it's of yourself or of the people you're working with, 
uh, you're constantly in the selection process, and it's okay to change and make a different decision uh, to take to take your organization or, or make a decision to take your life in a different direction. So, good God, how many times have we probably changed what we want to be when we grow up? I mean, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to try to figure out what we're going to be along the way. Try to enjoy yourself as you make those decisions. Before we leave partner, though. You know, I I think it's important when we were talking about the gatekeepers and those individuals that are going to get you to the hiring manager before you get the position to understand that even though you may not have all of the skill sets that may be within a a specific job description, apply for the job Um, or at least start evaluating the job description and start thinking about ways your military experience is, is more applicable to each of those bullet points. When I break it down and meet with individuals about what their skill sets are, it's amazing to me when I start asking really simple questions about, you mean you didn't do X? And they go, oh, gosh, yeah, I I did actually do that. And as a matter of fact, I managed uh, such and such budget. And it's like, and you didn't you didn't see that that bullet is applicable then? So you've got to be able to quantify it, put qualitative and quantitative uh you know, description there to be able to identify and relate to that so that you get the hits. Because uh, if we haven't talked about it before, I can tell you a lot of these um, corporations or companies actually take your resumes and put them within a system and a database where it's nothing but a big word search. That all That's all it is. They the, the talent person does data mining. They go out and put in keywords based on what the hiring manager said are requirements. That's what they start with first. Then they go down to um, what are the things that you would like to have, and they go into those fields. And then by the time they get done, they get, oh, I don't know, maybe 500, 1,000, 10,000 perspective people that they can go and start narrowing it down to. And they're going to only reach out maybe to the top 10, the top 20, the top 30 Uh, before they start making the second round and you actually become from a prospect to a candidate. So you've got to set your, you know, when Michael and you are talking about the planning and preparation, you've got to make sure you've done that well in advance. You've evaluated the different job descriptions. You know the industry and the market that you're going into. You've set yourself on the right path to be competitive in that market space. And then if you find jobs that are hit or miss and you got about an 80% plus, you know, match there, then, then launch. Uh, let them tell you no. Let them tell you no. That's going to be the big thing. So in deciding the partner, uh, I just wanted to throw that out there before we move on to location. No, great points. Love it. So in in location, you know, a lot of people, whenever I went uh, through the the military, um, I may have shared this, I don't know, but it, I'll kind of repeat myself if I did uh, apologize, but I didn't know, um, I knew I didn't want to go to the academy. Uh, Back then, the Sergeant Majors Academy was a one-year PCS move to Fort Bliss, Texas. And after that, they were going to sign me, and I'd already heard word probably where they were going to sign me. One of the locations was D.C. I knew good and well wherever they sent me after the academy was not going to be where I wanted to reside after I retired. So um, I made decisions along that way. Uh, But I knew then where I wanted to live. And, and I really was set on that because one of the things that my spouse asked me, my wife asked me was, um, are we done moving yet? Is this it? Can I start sinking roots in? Um, and part of that was because our, our children are a little bit older. They were going to be going into college or um, high school. And um, it was going to be very important to set those roots. So there are a number of reasons why we are going to determine the location of where it is that we're going to live. And you need to factor all of those variables in to make sure, again, that you just don't pick up the family because you're accustomed to it to move cross-country because you think it's the perfect opportunity. You might find, as I mentioned uh, to many people that I've counseled, that sometimes the grass is greener over the septic tank. It's not always because it's the best place, the best job, or whatever. When you get there, you begin to realize it's just as ugly and bad as the other location. So so let's move again and go back to where we came from, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. that's the problem. You know, when we make these mistakes and, and you're tying family into it, which I love because that's a, another planning consideration, right? But when we make these mistakes and we take the job, all right, we live in Bragg, but I've always wanted to live in Portland when there's a startup company that's hiring in Portland. So I've never met them. They've never met me, but we had three great phone calls and they're going to offer me a lot of money. So I'm yeah. going to move to Portland and take uproot the whole family to Portland. 
we all do these crazy harebrained schemes, and then when we run it by our trusted advocates, and I say that with air quotes, they don't reach down and tell us the truth because they're so scared of hurting our feelings or whatever. Yeah. I want the guys like Mike's friends to tell me, Scott, that is the dumbest idea that you have ever had in your life. And you know, then I go back and I run it by household six, you know, the boss, and I say, hey, honey, what's, what do you think about this? And then you know what? I turn on my ears and I take her counsel. So location is huge, not just geographically though, but it's also – financial locations, opportunistic locations, what other locations in the space-time continuum are, are you able to chase and apply? But if you don't understand the geographic area first and foremost, again, you're going to fail. I think from a transition perspective, what location is the number one question? You, you can address the other two yeah. uh, components of the R3, but as, as you spent a, a lifetime, a career for, for a lot of us, Moving around the company, uh, the country, and uprooting your family—that um, that the location that you settle on, like you said, Robert, that's the number one question. And it was for me. And uh, at a change of command ceremony several years ago, a, a friend asked me. I wasn't even wasn't even thinking of retiring then, but he said, you know, when you when you can figure out where you want to live, well, that's eighty percent of the problem solved. Yeah. Uh, once you figure that out, you narrow your job search. You narrow the industries that are located in that area. Um, that you won't move to Portland, Scott. You know, you would, I, I chose to retire and live in Colorado because of family, because of grandchildren, because of a lot of things, because it's so close to the ski slopes. Um, it, it's, it's just the, the place that, you know, Beth and I wanted to spend the rest of our life. And uh, so for me, 80% of the, the problem was already solved. Um, but that's not the solution for everybody. Obviously, everybody's not tied to the same um, things that I was tied to with, with where I wanted to retire. So you can either you can either retire in a location and find the opportunity there, or you can look a little bit broader and look at the opportunities you want and be willing to move to that location, which inherently has some risk. Uh, but you know we're all used to dealing with risk, and um, that can be mitigated some. But I, I think that for me, and I think for a lot of people transitioning, if you would ask yourself where I want to live. Uh, that would take a lot of the a lot of the pressure off the transition process. I think in today's uh, you know, and again speaking from corporate America, fortunately a lot of companies um, we, we tend to go back and forth. I mean, if if you look at how companies begin to think, you know, they they outsource, they insource, they outsource, and they did this as well with remote access. But there are remote access capabilities. Uh, with a lot of companies where they're beginning to realize or some have already realized for some time frame now the geographical lo location really limits um, talent pool capabilities so we we end up by opening up their broader perspective and allowing especially certain positions or certain roles within the organization to be um, remote access capable it allows then more talent opportunities to come to the table and I can get the best pool and the best individual and not necessarily be constrained to they have to live within a 50 mile radius of my brick and mortar building. Now again when you start thinking of corporations a lot bigger corporations think this way as opposed to smaller. Smaller are more like well if I have this position I might I'm really looking for them to be right here. Um, and, and I can tell you that uh, when we divested a, a segment of our business and I was meeting with one of the executives of this company, um, I was talking about that, you know, she was like, well, do you live in the Atlanta, uh, work out of the Atlanta office? And I go, no, actually, I don't even drive to the Atlanta office. I, I've been working out of my house for some period of time. And she's like, well, that's, a, that's an interesting concept. She goes, I like to be able to walk down the hall and grab my people and be able to conduct a meeting. I said, well, let me ask you something. You just mentioned to me earlier that you got staff down in South Florida. You got staff up in New York and you got staff in Ohio. So how easy is it to grab them from the hallway and put them in a conference room? She goes, no, no, I, I teleconference with those fee, uh, people. I go, well, then that's the same thing. Well, your remote access, as you begin to move through a certain level of the organization anyway, you're not going to be managing within a cubicle space or within a brick-and-mortar space. So if your organization can get out of that mindset, again, this is going back to selecting the right partner. If you evaluate those opportunities, Mike, you may not be constrained to a geographical lo location if you find the right fit and somebody who's willing to look for the right talent, maybe from a remote access capability. Well, 
And again, I was remiss in saying this earlier, and I almost started twitching when you were telling me that story because I absolutely despise micromanagement. I can't stand it. And if you're a soft guy or a military guy and you're used to having some ability, some rank on your, on your collars and the ability to freely operate, oh, wow, go to an organization to where you're being micromanaged and tell me how happy that makes you because you will be miserable. And, and back to location quickly, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the grass is always greener. And I have a great example of a very close friend of mine, um, a military academy guy who's very well qualified, very experienced, and he moved to a defense contracting hub in the south. But what he found there was he was a big fish when he wasn't in the defense contracting hub, and he moved to Huntsville, Alabama, where all these ra- – everybody oh, yeehaw. in Huntsville, Alabama. That's a great And place. he was a very small minnow in the ocean all of a sudden. So it's a double-edged sword. you got to realize that sometimes the location can bite you in the rear faster than, than you can even turn around and see it coming. Listen, nothing against Huntsville, Alabama. I actually lived uh, right down the road from there. That was one of my assignments that I had to take um, at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And uh, I went there kicking and screaming. I uh, didn't want to go there, but uh, unfortunately the Army decided uh, personnel command at that time frame, PERSCOM, um, which I think now it's called HCR or something, um, set, told me that that's where I had to go. And um, uh, so, anyway, I, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek. It's a, it's a great location. You know, it's not bad to raise the family I, for anybody that's listening. It's just, um, yeah. All of our fans in Huntsville, Alabama. So, <laughs> I don't think there's very many. Now, when you were talking about, uh, you know, the, that manager wanted to walk down and be able to touch you, physically grab you, I, I thought back to what we talked about on, on Sunday, or Monday night was why. You know, why do I need to get everybody together to, to be effective? And that's that maybe was her comfort zone. But, you know, we, we operate, you know, operations worldwide over VTC. And, and we, we execute decentralized operations every single day at the lowest common level. And so as a soft guy, I was thinking the whole time, man, if she really had to get her hand on me, um, that's exactly what Scott said. That's micromanagement. And I'm going to be less effective that way. I actually had a boss when I applied for a position that, um, I was totally qualified for it. And, and he picked up the phone and we were going through the final interview. And, um, I think it was a couple of days later, he called me back and, and I could tell he was struggling with it and I couldn't figure out what he was struggling with. And I'm like, you know, Hey, just go ahead. And I won't say his name, you know, John, go ahead and tell me what it is that you're kind of struggling with here. And he goes, you know, I, I have all my staff here. You would be the only staff member that would not be physically located here. And um, it's just something new for me. And I'm like, you know, John, I'll put it this way. Whether I'm managing somebody three cubes away, whether I'm managing somebody in the next building next door to me in the parking lot that I've got across, whether it's five states away, if I'm an effective leader, it doesn't matter. Geographical location doesn't matter. And again, it was one of the things hope that, you know, as I was working for different organizations, I started seeing more and more opportunity within them that they were um, uh, more open to uh, remote access. There, there's always this concern of, okay, if you're living at home, you're not doing anything, you're watching and babysitting your kids. And I can't tell you how many, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that video that's out there about conference calls. If not, I'll share it with you guys. But um, there's a conference call video that was made by a couple comedians that is classic. You know, you all of a sudden hear somebody that's in the room. Next thing you know, they're not in the room because their phone cut out. Or you have somebody's barking dog in the background. You got the crying, uh, crying baby that comes up. You got the, and these are the concerns that come up with why people don't want to do that because they figure if I can see you, Mike, in the room, then I know you're here. You're present mm-hmm. at the moment. I've got. Well, doesn't your mean t- I'm effective. No. It doesn't mean I'm efficient in the office. No. It just means I'm present. Well, so I used to have a term I call cubicle manager. And, and that was because I had a leader in the uh, the military in one of my last assignments. I actually worked in a cubicle. And I had a leader that walked around at a certain time after PT in the morning and looked to see how many cubicles were filled. He would then complain about it, usually about 11 o'clock in the uh, the morning, because certain cubicles weren't filled in the time frame he felt that felt they should be. He would then walk around later in the evening at a specific time and do the exact same thing. His measures of effectiveness, and mind you, I met the same kind of cubicle manager in the private sector when I separated out, and it was at a very C-level uh, position that I work for, you know, CEO, CFO, those types of things, CEO, and I won't say, but it, it was one of these things where... 
This individual felt like a good worker was one of those where he heard the pecking of the the, uh, the keyboard in the other room. He heard you on the phone and the whole bit, and it's 9 o'clock at night, and he's he's picking up his newspaper and his briefcase, and he's heading out the door, and he's like, that guy works hard. You know, that's the kind, kind of guy I'm looking for, you know? And instead of looking at the individual that may actually do the same amount of work in two hours that this guy takes 12 to do, it, we're not measuring it correctly. Uh, and I know we're getting a little off topic in terms of location and stuff, but I think when you look at remote access, that's the reason why you too have to evaluate the corporation that you're looking for. And it makes it more important from the partnership standpoint to make sure it fits the culture that you want. And remote access is a possibility. And if it is, then they understand that you're the right kind of person that's disciplined, uh, that the values and stuff that you bring from the military makes it to where you're not going to be out there, you know, on the beach uh, with your PC and, you know, chilling in the sun. Again, I wouldn't care uh, if I was your boss, because as long as you're doing the work I assigned you to, that's that's all that matters. But some of these people will really get nervous about that. Um, we, we had a battalion star major, a fifth group. I won't say his name. But every Friday, starting about two thirty, three o'clock, he would walk each floor of the team rooms, team room to team room, just to make sure that we were a still in uniform and b that the uh, the beer light wasn't on yet. And then he would go <laughs> top to bottom, and then bottom to top, and then come back to poke his head in the door, look around. You um, know, I'm running through names in my head right now. <laughs> you know, starts I, with a B. I love I'll that commercial that. where you have the guy who uh, snuck out the uh, the window and everything, and he opens it up and throws bird seeds on the keyboard and lets the bird start pecking on the uh, the keyboard. And the boss comes walking by. I'm telling you, that's the guy. That's the guy I work for. That it was like, oh, geez, yeah, yeah. Robert's a hard worker in there. Listen to that, you know. But to get back to your point, everybody knows that if you have a person. It, Work to, you know, don't work the time, work the standard. If it takes you two hours to do something, take somebody else to do eight, then totally. kudos to you. You know, have your employer better task you and better identify things for you to do that encapsulate your time. Uh, but people who just punch clocks and, and I don't understand clock watching and, and all that other stuff, it just, it's anathema to me. I don't, it, it just doesn't work in my head somehow. If you were asking me, you know, about should I move to a specific location because this sounds like the perfect opportunity, you know, it's got the right fit for my skill sets. The guy that or gal that I interviewed with as a hiring manager and the other three people that they passed me on to all seem to be really a good fit. I got a good vibe when I went there or I got a good vibe through the Google Plus, you know, interview process step of it. Um, when I got the opportunity to, to really meet them and shake their hands, they were very personable. It just seems like a good fit, but I'm going to have to move a thousand miles. My immediate response is, guy, if this is the perfect fit in every other aspect other than, than location, then you've really got to decide whether or not location is your key factor in your decision. Because if it's not, and you're willing to change that because you feel like everything else is a great opportunity, then, you know, by all means, consider that very highly because there's not a lot of people out there, honestly, that I've ran into, um, or I wouldn't say a lot, but there are several people out there that don't enjoy clocking in every day, don't enjoy where they work at, don't really enjoy the people that they work with or their bosses and the company, and they don't believe in the uh, values or the culture of the organization and what the mission and vision is of the organization. If you find all of that and location is the only deciding factor that you have to evaluate, you got some serious soul searching to do. Well, it's to me, R3 is very much like the iron triangle in project management, right? You know, scope, time, and cost. You can lengthen one leg, but that just makes the triangle lopsided. So if you if you try and shorten time, then either scope of the project gets lengthened or cost goes up or something else, right? But it's, it's the iron triangle of R3 as well. So you could find the ident perfect partner, but the location is kind of bad. It could give you the right, you know, kind of stepping stone capabilities. So it, it's just a, it's an isosceles. It starts out as an isosceles triangle you know three equal 90 degree points but all of a sudden it's as obtuse as can be because you got to give and go at some points but that triangle never breaks because some things are great some things aren't so great so let's ma let's match the partnership with the location so you mentioned stepping stone so let's just say that the, you're thinking this is a stepping stone opportunity it's not maybe totally the right fit for what you're thinking of doing but everything that you've seen from the organization, everything you've seen from what they're doing and their mission and vision and what they do in 
terms of you know products or services you believe in, um, all of that kind of stuff you feel comfortable in, then start evaluating the the company itself. Start evaluating the leadership team. Start evaluating the decisions that they've made in the past and what they're thinking about doing in the future that you see in rumor mill and stuff. Or what? Because I can tell you, a lot of employees get on these uh, these sites and actually start typing away of what they hear you know is going on just to kind of. Uh, to feel what's going to go on in the marketplace and how it might make adjustments. So, you know, start getting, do a little bit of your homework because I can tell you a lot of times you end up going within a company. And I think we mentioned in the last podcast, you, it, you may become very aware of your surroundings enough where you go, you know what, that's a position that I actually see myself in. And I would not have seen that had I not gone to this company and moved to this location and been a part of this environment, you know, or, like I did, I see an opportunity to create a position and see the benefit and value not only for myself, but back to the organization more importantly. And I know who it is that I can actually reach out to and present within the organization because they become a a trusted partner in our relationship through this move and by joining this organization that I can go to a Mike or I can go to a Scott and say, you know, I can present something to you in a position that needs to be created that can add tremendous value to the organization and matches the skills and talents that I bring to the table. And this is the return on investment that we're talking about. If you can measure that and do that, then then it's going to be everything. So, you know, when we're talking about figuring the partner and we're talking about the location, you've got to be able to see maybe in vision longer than today. You should be doing it, especially if you're talking about location and moving. My favorite thing in, in a conversation has happened recently because it kind of revalidated that, that my mindset wasn't as weird as many Australians would, would have me believe it is. When we were talking with Mike post his interview the other day and he said, well, this is just step A and I'm not going to you know air your plans to the world, Mike. But when you said that, you know, well, I'm looking at A, but A gets me to B, C, D, E, and F. And next thing you know, but Z is my target. That, that's where I'm going to go. That, that's when I went, I'm still okay. I'm still okay in my head, no matter what, you know, I don't need to be happy with now. And although I am happy with now because I have agendas, right? So when you we're it's a natural leapfrog and capabilities, when you find that right partner in this triangle and you find the right location and you're happy to move or stay, whatever the case is, and they give you that capability, is it a glass ceiling or, I mean, what, what is your future goals? What are, what are you truly internally looking to do? Because that might be a right capability for now, for the present, but in a year you might be going to school simultaneously and you might get a new degree or certification or skill set or desire, just simple desires change. Yep. And you might not be happy in that position anymore. So be true to yourself and understand where it is truly that you want to go. Be like Mike. You know, that's a quote of the day, right? And, and identify not only A through C, but it's not pace planning. It's pace through Z. I mean, it's, it's primary alternates, contingency, emergency, all the way down the road of where I want to be eventually. And you got to be I true think, to yourself. I think what we were talking about the other night was my first day on an A-team when I was completely happy being an A-team Charlie. Um, but deep in the back of my head, like all other 18 series guys, I wanted to be the team Jordan, right? I mean, that's... That's what every yeah, great there you boy go. aspires to be. He, he aspires to run his own detachment, to run his own training plan, to take the guys to another country and completely run a, a build partner capacity mission. So that's the way I'm approaching, I, I think, life. I, you know, yeah. I think that's the way all of us should approach it. Yes, there's an entry-level assignment, and, and, and I think that's, uh, that's what guys need to realize coming out too. They, they've got to find that foot in the door of whatever industry they want to work in but like what we've done, you know, it takes. It took me 14 years to get there from an 18 Charlie to be a team shorten. Um and I loved every single day of it. So you're right, Scott. I, I'm I'm happy with today. I'm going to be happy with the first, you know, new assignment, new job that I get when I finish my degree. But there's always going to be, I think, a, a career progression, a growth. It's personal growth, if nothing else. But see, you have what I would term realistic expectation management, right? You, you know that I, I was a CSM, I was an E9, I am now retired, I'm going into a new venture, so I will be the new guy. But when I said earlier to check your ego, a lot of people, it doesn't matter soft or not, 
refuse to be that new guy. And it doesn't matter if you got hired on as the chief operations officer or you got hired on as the mailroom clerk. You're starting, you're the new guy eventually when you transition. I mean, it's the very word itself means change, right? You're transitioning, you're doing something else. It's not the same. So you have to have realistic expectation management when you understand throughout R3 what your expectations are and then temper them with that little dose of that thing I like to say is reality, right? Because people can't understand that I, you didn't found the company. Or if you did found the company, there's going to be hurdles along the way. And you still don't get entitled to suites of the intercontinental and private jets just because you have a startup idea. It takes time. It takes energy. And you got to put the requisite amount of work in, much like your 14-year path to realize your goals of being a team sergeant. My first day in martial arts when I was seven years old, I got this cool little white belt. My dad was like, oh, Scott, you should be so proud you earned that belt. I'm like, no, man, that black belt is pretty cool. And I got three of them in three different types of martial arts, right? So when you, I did the same thing you did. I don't, I don't want to go and be an airborne guy. I want to be a Green Beret. I walked off the streets and I became a Green Beret. No matter how many drill sergeants told me I couldn't, no matter how many airborne instructors told me it was a flawed ideology and the x-ray sucked and everything else and to go back to being a barista and all this other stuff, right? <laughs> They didn't know you Although, were a barista. Come on. They didn't know He's I was doing a barista. It I, I mistakenly, I mistakenly <laughs> shared that with you guys. I know. It's not <laughs> funny when you bring it up, Scott. It's much better when we bring it up. <laughs> it's a preemptive strike. That's why. I'm, <laughs> it's like I've been on an ODA before or something. <laughs> So let's talk about the next uh, piece of this whole thing. So now that you've found the right partner, you're you know you're looking and have found the right location, whether that's locally or somewhere else that you're going to have to uh, have to up and move. Then we we got to start thinking about the right capability here, and, and some of that's identifying you know critical capability gaps. Um, and, and I touched on that a little bit in the very beginning in terms of evaluating what your skill sets are against the job description or, uh, that are out there. What a piece of advice that I mentioned to individuals, um, and I was mentioning to a, a person that you know really does resumes a lot, and she gave me other advice that I really liked. Um, and, I, and I think I shared the website earlier, and I'll try to tweet it out again, uh, that you can use to put in keywords and stuff that'll help you. But what I said was, Listen, if you know the industry that you're kind of going for, if you know the types of positions that you're kind of seeking and you think about the levels that you're wanting to go to, let's say you're shooting for uh, manager level. Well, then look for jobs not only at the manager level, but for the director level in various different industries. Take you uh, out a, a piece of paper or what I like better is a Word document. Go out there and start evaluating those different job descriptions and cut and paste everything that looks like something even remotely similar to what it is that you used to do within the military. And before you know it, you might have two pages, three pages worth of these bullets that you kind of copied and pasted. Well, realize what you're doing here is starting to build your qualitative, quantitative bullets, but also using keywords that are going to hit back to these industries and to these specific positions that you're actually going to be applying for. And you're going to understand basically uh, the, the understanding of your capabilities because it's going to make you more self-aware of what it is that who you are, what your background was, what your skill sets are. You may think it, uh, you know what it is, but when you start seeing how a uh, the private sector or the civilian community actually views certain things, you may go, gosh, I never thought about explaining it that way. You know, I never thought that I, I could actually apply it in that method and somebody might see it even better than the way I applied it. Um, so I love plagiarizing those job descriptions um, because most people will tell you anyway, when you go out there and apply a resume to put as many things from the job position, the job description that you're actually applying for within your resume, because you're going to get the most hits. So well, when, I, when I teach body language and networking and, and whatever, I always tell people, use the words that when you mirror them, don't just mirror their you know kinesthetics and their physical body language, but mirror the nonverbals as well. And most definitely mirror the word choice that they use because people like people like themselves. So you're in simpatico, right? You're in complete agreement with each other. So that's to your point, Robert. When when the company is looking for 
X, Y, Z, A, and B, and you put X, Y, Z, A, and B, they're like, hey, this guy gets it. Yeah. He's, yeah. You're, you're not plagiarizing. That has such a negative connotation to it. You're, you're using the tools at your advantage to better land the job that you want. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, identifying your gaps, uh, and I tell you that a lot of people um, are not comfortable. I mean, one of the worst questions that you can get asked in an interview, and by the way, I hate this question, is what are your weaknesses? But you really got to analyze what your weaknesses are and be willing to own up to some of those weaknesses. Um, I, I went through a, a seminar one time um, that at first, you know, I I. I didn't know if this guy, based on the the subject that he was teaching, was really going to be able to to keep me motivated throughout the uh, instruction. But what he talked about was your strengths and weaknesses and how human resources should be evaluated. At the end of the show or at the end of the class and everything, I started realizing that what he's really talking about is that instead of focusing on your weaknesses, we should be really focusing on our strengths that much more. Uh, more. You know, when you think about Tiger Woods when he went out there and uh, he had real problems, he used to be able to drive off the tee really well. He'd hit long tees that everybody knew and nod about and everything. But when it came to coming out of the sand trap, the guy wasn't very well. He wasn't really good at using his wedges in order to get up on the green. So what he did is he went out and hired somebody to work on his short game and on his wedges in order to improve that aspect of it. But what ended up happening? His tee started actually falling and he started having shorter drives and his whole game started getting out of whack because he changed who he was. He changed his process, how he was uh, used to attacking things, uh, how he was used to assessing the situation and going about his capabilities and skill sets and applying those to the, you know, what he was doing at hand. Well, this is no different than how you should approach the job market in applying your capabilities and strengths to what it is uh, of the position that you're applying for. And hopefully the industry that you're looking at uh, and the company you're looking at also see that weaknesses are not necessarily a negative. Well, I love the the false weaknesses, right? When when I was interviewing Marines that come into some of my programs, I would say, you know, all right, one of the questions here on this, you know, Marine Corps interviewing forum is, what are some of your weaknesses? And, and then I would laugh when I get the, I'm a perfectionist. You know, I spend too much time at work and away from my family. You know, I try too hard. You know, I'm such a giver. I'm overcommitted to work. I'm like, Those are kind of strengths that you're trying to mask as a weakness. You know, I... I if I'm blunt, I want the guy that doesn't care about his family and wants to come to work all the time and that is a perfectionist and obsessive, compulsive, disorder, attention to detail. That's that's what I'm looking for. So so quit trying to play me and give me an honest answer. But but to your point, Robert, of empowering your strengths, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that, again, I, I feel like a broken record, but self-awareness, checking your ego – understanding who you are. Everybody has strengths. Everybody most definitely, myself absolutely included, has many weaknesses. Um, empower your strengths. Educate yourself and try and minimize your weaknesses where you can, but know who you are. Be self-aware. Well, as a leader in a team, Chardon, uh, Mike, I know one of the things that you had to do is assess your team well enough to know weaknesses and strengths so that you can be, you know, you can accomplish the mission. And, and individuals... Uh, you try to overlap where one person's strength is to another person's weakness so that it's, you know, you have that solid capability. Uh, I think it's much in the same way. If we get rid of that crazy question, which I hate, about what are your weaknesses and actually start focusing more on the strengths. And, and if you can do that as well during the interview process, um, if we all know during the interview process that somebody's going to ask you that question and you're being taught that you should turn that weakness into a strength, why not just go ahead and take it head on and, and just say, you know what, everybody has uh, weaknesses, everybody has um, you know things that they'd like to improve upon, but you know, I, I, there's several different ways you can can't, uh, tackle that question. The real thing that you want to try to highlight so much of that they even forget maybe to ask that question in their list of questions is your capabilities, you know, those things that you bring to the table. Um, because um, if you ever listen to somebody who is a professional interviewer, what they do 
uh, or somebody who's a professional interviewee, I should say, uh, what they do is they try to control um, enough of the mic time so that you can ask them multiple questions. What you do is instead you take that opportunity to highlight many of your capabilities. You don't make it such that you're boring the other individual, other individual, but you're doing it in such a way that you're really in, you know, showing how that can add value to the organization. Uh, it might lend itself to where before you know the times run out, you don't get that crazy question about what are your weaknesses anyway. But I was I was going through a very long training course uh, years ago, and the best question I ever got a series of questions I got asked, and, and the cadre turned out to be a good friend of mine in the future. But he said, um, you know, I, I was a student. He said, Scott, how would you, you know, here's problem solving skill set. So how would you put a giraffe in the fridge? And I said, uh, I don't know. You know, and he's like, open the door and put him in. And he goes, how would you put an elephant in the, in the fridge? And I said, well, open the door and put him in. He goes, no, open the door, take out the giraffe and put the elephant in the fridge. You're overcomplicating things. And I went, <laughs> All right, thanks. You know, I can't win here, but but know who you are, and that's the thing. Because of this quiet professional ethos that many of us kind of embody in this uber professional, we without that outside counsel that Mike referred to earlier. Again, going back to the, I asked for advice. I got taken down a longer but potentially better road to get to where I want to be eventually, career wise. Without that valued counsel and knowing your capabilities, you shortchange yourself in many a situation, including interviews. Any military guy has problem solving in his court, especially if you're deployed and especially if you've been a combat veteran. You've got problem solving skills that are valuable to an organization, I almost guarantee you. You've got disciplinary skills. You've got work ethic skills. Now, you might not be voicing those because you think that this is just the norm for everybody that ever wore a uniform. But again, this is mentors for military. Voice your skills. Understand what you're good at. Understand what strengths you have. And ask people, hey, Robert, what do you think I'm good at? We've known each other for two months now. Hey, Sergeant Major Pritch, you've got 25 years in the military. What do you think I'm decent at as I'm applying for jobs and trying to look for my next me? Coffee. And take that information and process it. You know, Robert, I'm glad that you you brought up the way we did things on teams. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to relate that to the right capability. Um, something we used to do, we used to do it very well, was called battle-focused analysis. And I know the Army's changed its terms, and we don't spend time doing that much anymore. But when we got a mission set, we looked at every specific collective and individual task that we had to accomplish, and we rated ourselves on it. Whether we, you know, were, it was your old TPU, whether you, you were proficient at it, whether you were practiced at it, or whether you were completely untrained at it. Um, and, and based on that, we developed a training plan to to get there. And I think that's where we're going with identifying for transition the right capability. You're not going to walk out and walk right into an organization and say, hey, these are my transferable skills and this is exactly what I can do from you. What you need to do is you need to do some, some self you know, uh, analysis and, and do, a, do that BFA, man. You know, Look at what you're strong at. Look at where you're weak and then fix the places you're weak. Develop a training plan a year out from transition. So you start, you know, if it's an education plan or if it's, if it's just, you know, working on transferable skills and, and the new language that you're going to learn going into business, but you've got to create all of that. We do that every time we assume a new position. No new position in the Army comes without education. You know, we're, right, we're How many always, guys do you know in a community, sorry, that are like within a year of getting their degree and yet you've known them for 10 years and they still haven't taken that last step? Yeah, well, Ryan, you know, finally is doing it now. I told him about it about ten years ago, and I, I think he's he's getting his master's now. So good on you, Ryan. Proud of you, brother. But I mean, to your point, right? Yeah. Like we, we we when we get a mission, we we do this by default. We we all just right to it. You know, this is what I have to do to execute that mission. But when our mission is transitioning and our mission is bettering ourselves, we can't. And you, you know, we can put all these, you know, army of one awesome cool guy terms on it, right? Like loyalty and integrity and selfless service and all this stuff. I'm giving to my team. I'm not giving to myself. Well, you know what? That's not going to help you in a future life, brother. Like, good on you, man. You gave to your team and then you left and the military machine rolled right over you and left you in the dust. Because, and that's a hard lesson to swallow, but 
The military functioned just fine when I left. It functioned just fine when Robert left. It functioned just fine when you left. We have to set ourselves up for the best transition possible and quit making excuses and just do it. I don't know about when you left, Scott, but I think it fell apart when Mike and I left. But uh, the quiet professional, getting back to that in terms of um, – you know, whether you're in the quiet professional field or you're kind of an introvert and everything, one of the things I also find is that there are a lot of people who um, are just not wanting to take credit for team accomplishments. Um, it's one of the the, the 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 bigger items that I think I run across when I start talking about uh, what do you bring to the table, what are some of your capabilities and everything. And when I bring up something, you know, specific, they'll they'll go, well, yeah, we did that. Uh, we kind of had a, a initiative that we did that with, and there was about ten of us, and I did this role, and it's like, but did you did you do that? Did you do it within the timeline? Did you accomplish? Oh yeah, we received you know X awards, or we were you know awarded you know this or, well, that's a team accomplishment. I get it, but you played an integral part of that take credit for those opportunities as part of your capabilities that you bring to the table. Not only was it a lesson learned of something and a skill that you learned 